our next speaker is Erna Paris, and I will um, introduce her uh, simply by, by reading this uh, quote from Thucydides, who said, the strong do what they will, the weak seek justice. Erna. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. What a pleasure to be here. I've been here for concerts and never dreamed I'd be actually standing on the stage. Interestingly, my talk, uh, as you will see, concerns magic, war, and ethics. I have been perhaps obsessed with politics, mainly international politics, for most of my life. And a little story, I think, will, will, will be an example of that. Some decades ago, as I was giving birth to my son and under the influence of an epidural, I heard myself um, announcing or, or uh, uh, making a disquisition to the doctor and the nurses who were attending to me about something the Soviet Union had done a few days previous. Now I noticed that they were looking at each other and smirking and I thought they were extremely rude. Why weren't they engaging me in conversation? So that gives you an idea of the depth of my obsessions. Well. <laughs> There is, of course, a vast cornucopia to talk about when it comes to international relations. So I'm going to talk about one issue that has intrigued me really since 1983, when I was first researching the, uh, the story of the return of Klaus Barbie to France, Klaus Barbie being Nazi war criminal, and uh, my book dealt with his return to France, what happened when he returned, and his trial. Uh, and the thing that, uh, that fascinated me, and which has fascinated me ever since, was the role that an amnesty for wartime collaboration played in the return of this criminal uh, 30 years later. Let me just describe to you, I'm sure you know, but just make it clear what an am a political amnesty is, a general amnesty. These things usually take place, it's a tool of international relations, takes place at the end of a war or when there needs to be a transition, and it's part of the negotiation. Of course, all countries have to move on after a crisis of this nature. And this is one, as I say, of the tools that the international community community uses, uh, especially those in the realist camp think that it's useful. And what I want to uh, bring to your attention and, and, and make you think about today is whether or not this is a useful tool and whether in fact it, it is something that, that we should not be bringing into play as often as we do because it's around all the time. Right now, as you may know, they are discussing amnesties, general, large amnesties for the Taliban and the United Nations itself is about to get into it. So an amnesty legally is forgetting and forgiving all past offenses that took place during a certain uh, period of time. And that means forgiving people who may have committed crimes against humanity, atrocities. Uh, think of Sierra Leone. They had an amnesty. It didn't last. But in Sierra Leone, as you may recall, people were not just murdered, but they, they were mutilated, uh, body parts were hacked off, and so on. So an amnesty to major perpetrators is, in fact, an, an ethical issue. And I would suggest that the thinking about it is magical, <laughs> because effectively it doesn't work and this is what I want to talk to you about. When we make an amnesty at its very, the bottom line is, uh, to be a little glib about it, one side says to, the, the, the winning side says to the losers, okay, um, we're going to forgive and forget as long as you promise to be very, very good and stop doing what you were doing. Don't get, don't get into any more trouble. I mean, I admit that's glib, but that's basically what it's about. The problem with, am, with amnesties and the reason they don't work is this. The victims of human rights abuses never forget. And neither do their children or their children's children. Even if they are told officially that they must, they don't. It may take years. 
It may take decades, but when that group of people, the victims, finally feel strong enough in the society, they will bring the issue to the fore again and create, possibly create new chaos. Because when the past is pushed under the rug, it doesn't just go away, it sits there until it comes up again and causes new problems for society. Coming back to France, this is where I first saw this and was amazed. The French passed an amnesty law in the 1950s, meaning that no person who had collaborated, in other words, who had murdered co-citizens, who had participated in helping deport almost 80,000 French Jews to places like Auschwitz, nobody like that could ever, ever be tried. This held, amazingly, for about 30 years until the next generation of victims felt the strength. They brought it forward into society. There was havoc, like you can't imagine. The issue was so raw because it had never been dealt with. Subsequently, Klaus Barbie was arrested in Bolivia, you may remember this, came back, was brought back, tried in France. The havoc didn't stop. The French government was obliged eventually in the 1980s and 90s to uh, over, overrule its own amnesty law, bring its own people to trial for collaboration for crimes against humanity. The last trial was in 1996, if you can imagine, 50 years after the war, and the French are still talking about it. Another really interesting example of the same thing was in the news just last week. Spain passed a general amnesty law in 1977 after the death of Franco. Now, 100,000 people are known to have been forcibly disappeared in Spain during the, the, the Civil War and during the Franco era. These crimes have all just been buried because of the amnesty. Nobody has ever dealt with them. Well, when the Spanish passed their amnesty law, they could have no idea that one of their own, a judge named Balthazar Garçon, would become the person in the world to kickstart, initiate the new movement for international justice that has emerged in the 1990s and continues in force today. You'll remember Garçon because it was he who issued an arrest warrant for General Augusto Pinochet. Um, Pinochet was not arrested. Uh, he was sent back to Chile. But the process had begun under something called, in legal terms, universal jurisdiction, which basically means it's been around a long time, although it was never used before. Any country has the right to try people for crimes against humanity, genocide, and so on. Balthazar was the first to bring that into public light. So he, he was a Spaniard. Needless to say, when he, once he did that, rumblings began in Spanish society from the victims and their children, and in, in some cases, grandchildren. I know this because some of these people wrote me because I've written on the topic. Balthazar Garzon started investigating some of these cases, and then the trouble started for him. Far-rightist Franco groups were of course, exceptionally disturbed by this. And two of them brought charges against the judge for breaching the amnesty. This was heard by the Spanish Supreme Court. And just last month, they agreed with the groups. And Judge Garçon has been dismissed from the, from the bench while, while his trial, while awaiting his trial. This is to tell you that these issues never die and that we can promote all the gifts of amnesty that we wish, but if we do not deal with the victims and their need for justice, some kind of justice, then the situation it will keep coming back to, to bite uh, the, the, the people in question. Now, are there any other possibilities that 
aside from amnesty, for moving on after these kinds of issues, these kinds of wars and transition. There are. One is a simple apology made from the highest level of government. It has to be sincere, genuine, and seen to be so. Many victims, basically all they want is acknowledgement. They don't want to be told that what happened to them didn't happen. The second is the possibility of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And the way that works uh, is that the victims come and under oath, they tell their stories. The perpetrators come and under oath, they confess and, and perhaps express remorse. It is to be hoped. And the theory is, the hope is, that reconciliation will emerge from this. Now, South Africa has had the most successful, in my view, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There have been many in the past 20 years. And the reason that South America's was successful was because it had broad public support. Not, not entirely from the white community, naturally they had been engaged in, in apartheid, but with enough representatives from the white community to make it multiracial. And it had very support from very high-level high level people. The second thing about that uh, 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 Truth and Reconciliation Commission is that the perpetrators were there. And the reason they were there was that the, um, the, the commission used a carrot and stick approach. The carrot was to the perpetrators, if you come and tell us what you did, then you may receive personal amnesty. Not a general amnesty for anybody, but depending on what you did, you may receive amnesty, it will be looked into. So one individual might. Now I want to make that distinction between one individual and a general amnesty. The stick was that if you don't come, you may face a trial, a real trial, in a real courtroom. So a lot of them came. And it was incredibly dramatic to see the confrontation between uh, victims and perpetrators on the, the television uh, screens of the nation. Now, wh what we can say about the South African Commission is that there's been no violence since then. And I think that's the strongest, uh, most powerful evidence of its success. Of course, there were lots of things that, that people complained about, but there's been no violence. Let me speak for a minute about our current Canadian Residential Schools, TRC. It is very important. This is an issue that has uh, uh, created poison in our society for a hundred years. It has come to the fore. We had a major government apology. But what do we have? We have victims coming to the commission, telling their stories to each other. It's like a therapy session. Where are the perpetrators? Well, I've read the mandate for this commission, and the commission has no, does not have the right to subpoena perpetrators. So you may have seen the Globe and Mail a couple of days ago, there are perpetrator groups there, the, the churches. And they've set up a welcome tent, and they're going to assist people if they have psychological difficulties. They're going to, in other words, perform a church-like or social work-like function. But imagine what it would be like for all of us as Canadians to see perpetrators or representatives of perpetrator groups under oath, up there on a stage with, those, with the people that were harmed so profoundly. That would engage us, and we as Canadians need to be engaged, but we're not. And I'm very sorry to say I don't believe we will because of the structure of this TRC. And I believe also that it was structured this way deliberately, obviously, for um, political reasons. Finally, I'd like to talk about the th uh, another way that we can avoid the problematic amnesties and also bring justice in some form or other to the victims. And that is real courts. Uh, to try crimes against humanity, genocide, and the major war crimes. The first instance of such a court in history was the Nuremberg Tribunal after the Second World War, when the top Nazis were judged by the, the Allies. 
Nuremberg, some people think Nuremberg was the most important event of the 20th century. Why? Because it defined for the first time something the world has always known, because it's always been there, crimes against humanity. It gave language to crimes against humanity, entered the, the, the books of international law, and has remained there for future use. During the Cold War, the, the, the lessons of Nuremberg, and I haven't got time to describe exactly what they were, disappeared. They came back in the 1990s when the Security Council didn't know what to do about the civil wars, about outbreaks of genocide in Bosnia and Rwanda. They set up courts for former Yugoslavia, for Rwanda, uh, probably hoping, expecting that nothing would happen uh, because they had to be seen to be doing something. To everyone's surprise, these courts, although they've had many problems, have had an enormous effect in the communities. I went back to Bosnia and talked to people, and although there were people who said they weren't doing enough, there were people who said, yes, the, rec the recognition of our suffering is, is important to us. So uh, uh, the, the, the international community set up these courts. And then finally, within the last decade, we have something brand new in the world. A permanent, independent, international criminal court called the ICC functioning in The Hague. It is hearing cases, it is perfectly functional, it is supported by more than half the countries in the world. It is an idea that has been dreamed about for centuries. You can go back to the ancient Greeks and find the origins of talk for a way of bringing accountability to those who perpetrate massive injustices in the world. This court is an astonishing creation of our time. It has flown under the radar, unfortunately, but if you want to learn more about it, you can buy my latest book. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me leave you with the thought that amnesties can't work because they ignore the victims, and that there can be no true peace, no lasting peace, without justice of some kind. Thank you. <laughs>